to quite an interesting person. I'll hand you over now to Robert Maxwell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Without further ado, since you now know who I am, I'll plunge into a brief uh, quotation from Tomas Maldonado, a stiffer person than whom there isn't to meet. He says, phylogenetically and ontologically, <laughs> well, this is serious. <laughs> the making of our environment and the making of ourselves has been a single process. But if that work is a factor in self-realization, it is also a factor in alienation. It's obvious by now that the particular mode in which consciousness takes hold of environmental reality has a decisive influence on the ultimate configuration of that reality. Now, the reason why I quote from Thomas Maldonado is because uh, he's one of those agonized figures such as Kenneth Frampton and Thomas Maldonado and Manfredi Tafuri and Ken Frampton and so on, who see a kind of apocalyptic destiny in front of us, uh, which is also behind us and which in fact is closing in from every side. There isn't much time left. We'd better get ourselves together before the uh, doom strikes. And there does seem to be a note of doom. Oh, that's wrong. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, there does seem to be a note of doom in Charles James' book, Postmodern Architecture, which uh, takes as one of its starting points the demolition in Saint Louis in Saint Louis, Saint Louis in 1972, the destruction of a comparatively recent uh, 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 package of homes, which obviously brings into question uh, whether new things uh, can be preserved. We've been used to knocking down old things. Now we've got the new things to knock down as well, and so we're obviously into a new stage of development. And it also has this quality, which is a nice quality, of suggesting that apart from at home, where we've got electricity and ice in the refrigerator, everywhere else the world is just about coming to an end. That's the feeling which was painted in 1913 by I forget who, and which was, as you can see, a quite... Uh, uh, quite predictive. Things did get knocked down. Um, and uh, so the moment seems to be this moment of doom in which we understand that the very agonized business that Thomas Maldonado refers to, in which we catch hold of our environment and get to know it by stating it, uh, has reached a kind of crisis. The crisis is the end of the modern movement. The modern movement was important because it signified a stage in which buildings would no longer get designed traditionally, but according to a new process called design. And I mentioned the other night with, uh, with the Kulo Kriya Shumi debate that the word design hadn't been mentioned throughout the uh, evening, and that I thought this was rather, uh, rather odd, because it's design and it's, it's related uh, twin of management, which puts us into the problem we're in. If there wasn't a problem of designing the environment and of controlling it and of preventing bad futures from erupting upon us, uh, we would all be able to kind of enjoy ourselves consuming. It's because of this design problem that we have a predicament of modern architecture. If modern architecture was nothing but a succession of interesting villas by Le Corbusier and Robert Stern, for example, it wouldn't affect very many people except those who uh, actually got invited to the parties. And uh, the others, of course, would want to be invited too, naturally. But uh, they wouldn't have the chance, and uh, it wouldn't affect them, and so it would all just be a little private affair. But unfortunately, it's not like that. You probably get the note of English pragmatism creeping in now. Um, the English, in fact, were remarkably successful in the post-war period in designing buildings, including designing housing, housing being a form of building. And uh, we saw many successful schemes which uh, 
invented a way of managing the environment. They were systematic. The building could, as it were, be reproduced indefinitely, creeping its way across the landscape, and uh, in the end would mount up to being, in fact, uh, a town, presumably. This idea of design, the idea of management, the idea that, therefore, what we're doing has to be systematized is at the core of the problem. Uh, in the modern movement, no one was concerned so absolutely with the didactic problem of what is architecture and what does it do as Hannes Mayer. And it was he who enunciated the principles of design, which consists very largely of classifying everything and then putting everything of the same kind together, such as, for instance, uh, flats. Uh, are classified into flats and the laundry. The laundry is put down below, the chimney goes up high, and everybody else put together into the, the other classification flats. And there are subcategories of one person, two person, three person, and four person flats, which are suitably arranged according to some diagram somewhere or other. And this is design. And one of the faults of design is that it demands of the designer that he states the whole problem and solves the whole problem. There's a kind of problem of the drawing board in which you have to ask yourself, well now, have I left anything out? Uh, and naturally, in the end, your drawing board tends to fill up with whole cities. Because only in the whole city can you be sure that you haven't left anything out. And even then, as David Dunster points out, you've left out factories and fields. But okay, for the moment, you've got to everything in, and it can be systematized, as uh, Isosaki has shown, a fragment here and the whole city there. Uh, in that new city, we are, we are uh, given the benefit of design in the sense that everything happens very nicely and naturally and randomly, but very clearly and simply. There are only two kinds of things, uh, service car structures and plug-in facilities. And so it's much easier to understand, you see, much easier to understand what it's all about. And that way you can uh, look across your drawing board and master the whole problem. Uh, this tendency to leave nothing out and to master the whole problem, I suppose, goes back to the beginning of alienation, which uh, Manfredo Tafuri pretty well locates on this uh, plan by Piranesi for Rome, where he reconstructs a Rome that never was and extends current notions of design so that you get huge entities of design which extend over whole quarters, uh, something which never was built. The city has built is much smaller little uh, units of design, and uh, as built, uh, they uh, inevitably clash in some way and make uh, interesting juxtapositions, of course. As Colonel points out, the whole thing can be viewed as a collage, more or less accidental, more or less inspired. The 18th century, around the Enlightenment, is taken as the time when men began to think big and to think the boundaries of knowledge. It was a process of learning to think abstractly and philosoph philosophically in a way which hadn't been achieved before. And people like Boulet and de Sade, in fact, are exploring the boundaries of what is possible in a new way. And it's often thought, I think, that because of this interest on the boundaries, uh, uh, the whole of society is somehow uh, uh, set at risk. It is, of course. I would say that Manfredo Tafiri's history of architecture is a history of the action on the boundaries. That point where somebody is thinking of a new way in which it could possibly be structured, in which the world could possibly be structured. And from that boundary, certain kinds of models get fed back towards the, the center of the, of the organism, the cell, the body of the population, and there they get put to work in a quite different way, in a pragmatic way which adjusts to the realities of life and in which they, in fact, turn into fragments. Now, the question is as to whether this boundary definition of the culture is the same as and is the all-powerful key to the character of the civilization or whether there is some kind of dialectical process which goes on with inputs from this boundary, but with also uh, inputs from another realm, something much less uh, cohesive, much less to be seized, much less to be defined, which one could call, roughly speaking, the tradition of that society. 
I do, in fact, see nothing, uh, no way of explaining ourselves except some sort of dialectical process in which um, mind advances on the boundaries and feeds back ideas which are then in some way absorbed into the body of society and that includes getting built. Uh, this, of course, brings up the question of utopias uh, and Manfredo Tafuri particularly singles out the Corbusier plan, Corbus plan for uh, Algeria, Algiers, as being uh, exemplary in the way it clarifies what ought to be there. The uh, uh, luxury apartments making rather baroque shapes up top, the workers' apartments form a convenient base for the motorway at the bottom, and the business uh, uh, conveniently pushed out a uh, little way into the water or facing the seafront where it could feel uh, at command of everything. It's a cruel scheme, but it has the merit of being clear. So was the Vazin plan for Paris, a cruel scheme, but it has the merit of being clear. Uh, these utopias don't ever get built, but fragments of them are absorbed in society, and little mini towers will occur just north of, of Euston Station, which bear a very faint resemblance to uh, uh, this radiant dream. I suppose the, the person who really started off this, this thing was uh, Tony Garnier, who between 1907 and 1914 envisaged a modern city, the Cité Industrielle, in amazing concrete detail, as to say concrete insofar as he pictured it and described it for an imaginary realm quite near to Lyon, but imaginary, nevertheless highly topographical and varied so that uh, you can see his studies have a remarkable grasp of the reality of that city as built. He envisaged it in a very convincing way, an as-built situation. And as well as doing that, he also virtually invented the concepts of town planning through classification and zonification, because the parts of his city were separated out to allow growth and change, and were characterized by the dominant type of use. So you had the commercial city or the residential city with the commerce in the middle which is that and the industrial city which was the factories further over uh, downwind and the health city up top and the hotel city around the railway station and so on and it must have been his assiduity in delineating this city which I think uh, influenced Corbusier to believe that he could advocate a city for three million and hope to have it actually adopted he went through a period of years when he was pretty well waiting for the French government to telephone him and say, Monsieur Le Corbusier, the president, or whatever it is, the premier ministre, vous attend. Get along here quick, we're about to build it. But this didn't happen, and he was reduced to the usual polemics of uh, complaint against lack of vision in high places, and the dream faded out. He went on building buildings, uh, but he didn't build the city for, for, for three million. And we can, I suppose, be glad Although I'd rather have one city for three million than all the little fragments of, of it that we've got all over all the, all the other cities, including London. And this spirit of being able to build whole cities or whole extensions to cities at a time has been absolutely normal during the last period, the 60s. We, we have seen nothing strange, exciting, yes, but nothing really strange about Tenzo Otange's proposal to colonize Tokyo Bay. In fact, since there isn't enough land in Japan, it seems to be ecologically sound and uh, uh, exciting. Um, but we, do, we didn't see anything strange when that came out. And the idea that there's a much clearer system of building, which is functionally um, exhibited, uh, could ever, uh, uh, no doubt that it could become a kind of living place. And similarly, uh, Candidus Woods became the kind of great hope, I think, of the humane architects because of Shad Wood's connection with the Team 10 people and his friendship with the Smithsons. There is a constant hankering after the kind of varied scheme which, the, which this town of Bochum uh, would simplify, in which there is quite evidently system at work, while within it some kind of variation and, and uh, variety, which ostensibly makes it humane. Uh, uh, for instance, the Smithson's idea of the mat building as a useful alternative to the slab building is part of this hope that 
we could still do regular architecture, uh, which would be entirely designed and controlled, and which would uh, then be able to accept life without being eroded by life. Another idea was a megastructure idea in which the system, uh, big structure or services feeds, is so clear and necessary that it would be beyond erosion. In fact, um, the erosion would be deflected by the ability to plug in anything you like everywhere else. So those kind of structures uh, uh, have persisted. And I think the most interesting case of this must be the, the work of Matthias Ungers, where in fact we do see erosion beginning, uh, but in a very remarkable way. Uh, these are plans for areas in Berlin, and as you can see, particularly on the right, uh, uh, they do have this characteristic of functional zoning and uh, clarification by types, so that the buildings of one type are put in one place, and the thing makes a very clear pattern, the pattern which the designer can see, and which he hopes will persist uh, after the thing has been opened uh, to the erosion of life. And even a kind of metaphysical quality creeps in, in which we are allowed to state a very uh, precise building form, a very pristine building form, which uh, nevertheless has a regularity within it, a regularity which does relate to the existing pattern of streets, but which nevertheless uh, uh, exists only in the mannerist game of confirming by denying, confront confirmation by momentary denial, uh, so that we're still left with the characteristic of a total design object through which some life flows, as it were, some accident happens, but which is, in fact, still pristine and controls the situation. Well, this idea of system as being the main aspect of design has been caricatured by Isha, and I always like this, uh, this uh, contrast of the Viradio seen without any sky, the, the, the Voisin plan, rather, seen when the sky has gone, and, and Escher's drawing, because it does, well, it expresses uh, feeling that system, as it proliferates, leaves no ground for anything else, that it must be all-embracing. The computer must have every possibility within it, uh, because uh, uh, if it left something out, that would be uh, bad management. And the system idea is reflected in terms of architectural character by a curious suaveness. These blocks were put up in Angoulême around, uh, around about 1960. You probably know them very well from the annual drive south. Uh, they're quite extensive. And the French seem particularly fond of that period of the suave plan in which some kind of reference to a town planning space is made, but uh, the building acts as a whole. The pattern of windows is a mechanical one. I thought this contrasted rather nicely with one of my seaside buildings. I think it's at Thorpe Ness, where you get a similar idea of the building forming a curved terrace or crescent, but where there's a good deal more uh, variety and individuality of the parts. They're not, uh, they're not uh, classified into a single category of apartment with a single form of expression. Now, it seems to me that this is the point where postmodern architecture re uh, emerges, uh, the point where, in fact, we're, we're sick of this simplicity and we're hankering after some kind of uh, human reality. Um, and that uh, we, we're looking, in fact, for the variety within order which makes old cities such enjoyable places to be in. Uh, the most stupendous case of misunderstanding, I think, uh, in this uh, process of looking for process is habitat, which by Shafi's own uh, justification is meant to be a kind of modern vernacular. The higgledy piggledyness of it signifies that uh, uh, it, it is the result of a more or less accidental process, and he likened it to the Pueblo villages of New Mexico, where, in fact, you get a similar lack of concern for individual buildings as newcomers. They just fit into a total pattern. It's this total pattern which the system men like. It's the idea that nothing is left out, that everything is controlled. In order to control everything, you have to have a varied system. And this variation is analogous to uh, the variations you get in a computer game, for example. It is all the permutations from a given very limiting classification. It is, of course, absolutely absurd, since every one of those buildings is locked into its position finally and forever by the, uh, uh, by the uh, command of the structural engineer who had to know where his reinforcing rods were going. And so it's a mere analogy 
of a process, and it's false in every way. Um, in the same way, there's been a curious outcrop of ideas of uh, looking to the history of buildings and the history of settlements as ways of providing keys to how design can be brought back into the social body. Well, uh, Lou Kahn was rather keen on Semingiano, and it did have some effect on his architecture. Um, uh, Fabrizi hated New York. He said the skyscrapers are too many and too small. He wanted to have fewer and larger. But there has been a big lobby praising New York because of the fact that at the scale of massive city development, it has repeated the accidental pattern that you find in a little city town, uh, hill city, uh, the land values and the wish to be where the prestige zone was has created a kind of uh, uh, an analogy to a natural process in which by accident and trial and selection and some Darwinian process at that time, all the big builders find themselves close together, either at this end or up mid-Manhattan, mid in the total effect is very varied and looks as if, well, from the design point of view, it is the result of having launched a massive commercial operation, uh, something like, um, um, well, something like a hundred years of continuous process and continuous biological culture has produced this characteristic and very astounding form. And so we find that when New York goes big in the Rockefeller Center, it imitates its own form. The various parts of the Rockefeller buildings are scattered about at different heights and um, in a way are imitating that old uh, hill city, uh, but deliberately through aesthetic choice. This isn't in itself the result of a uh, natural selection process, but an aesthetic control which adjusts the form of the buildings to the city. I dare say a good deal of the of the constraints were provided by light angles and so on uh, on the various sides of the plots. But nevertheless, it does have this fitting in character, a kind of aesthetic of uh, process grafted onto it. And the same is even more true of the unbuilt graphics art uh, uh, project by Paul Rudolph, where you can see very clearly, apart from the fuzziness of the slide, the, um, the way in which the architect is now imitating process and offering to substitute for a natural process over time, a process of trial and error and, and of uh, natural selection, a designed process in which permutations and the variety of those permutations supply the necessary variety. These are both, in some ways, the aftermath of wars. The one on the right is the field of abandoned fridges left by the Americans uh, uh, at uh, um, one, of the, one of the key cities when they got out. And um, I couldn't help thinking that it does uh, supply very nicely if one can make it sufficiently fuzzy. Uh, well, I can't make it fuzzy. It, if one could make it fuzzy, one could see that it, it looked like a, a downtown of a rather, rather nice city. That, that quality of accident with similarity of, uh, of, uh, of the element is something which we all, I think, respond to. And at the same time, in this housing development, cheap housing put up for Korean vet veterans on, a, on cheaply acquired land where the hillside had previously ruled out building, it does just the opposite in a way. It produces that old pattern which we in England used to think of as the opposite of design, ribbon development. That's to say the haphazard putting together of things uh, along where it was easiest to build. So you make the roads wherever the contours allow, and that's where you build. It has, however, I think, a, a curious charm once you get used to the idea. And um, uh, it does actually consist of houses. And that's where I'd like to split my theme now and come on to this question of houses. When uh, the Bastides were built, the English invented the regular Roman plan. Well, I mean, they imitated it but they invented the application of it to modern warfare, and they built uh, quite a number of Bastides on this regular plan, more or less identical with this one. You knew where you were. You had a couple of main streets and subsidiary cross streets, very quick to divide it up into plots and get people to write their names on the plots and guarantee to build the houses. The other picture is the rooftops of Bern, uh, which wasn't laid out in quite such a regular way, but it does illustrate uh, the kind of pattern that results from an actual historical process of 
uh, of uh, competition and natural selection taking place. Now, what I'm onto here is that this process is not a process which is in itself aesthetic. That's to say, it doesn't occur as design on the drawing board, but as a result of social convention over a period of time. The people who build those houses to conform to that plan are all people who have some idea of forming part of the social body and contributing it towards it. And this you'll find most characteristically in the Berger society of uh, Holland, pre-Renaissance, pre, uh, or just coming in for Renaissance, when everyone had the right to trade and to get rich and then to build his house. But you'll also find it, as I found it, in a rural slum at Pinar del Rio in Cuba, where uh, the conditions were noticeably better than in the urban slum, where everybody obviously took care of their houses and uh, did something to, to, to paint them up even, uh, and, uh, and looked after them. And it seems to me that you had the same quality exactly of the householder becoming a member of a group which is the social group, and that the house, therefore, is a concept is very important. Uh, just to see how flexible this house is, in Amsterdam, they advance across the bridge to meet you like a host of people holding out their hands, and uh, quite clearly, each one stands for a person or family. And in Enfleur, where the land values uh, at the harbor have pushed up, uh, the, uh, uh, have been pushed up, by the desirability of that spot, the houses on the original little plots have crept up to be quite enormously high, uh, but they still remain a characteristic house, the convention which was available at that time. Important, I think, to retrieve this convention, even if it's only been done successfully by uh, Francois Squerry and Paul Grimaud. Um, he does, in spite of one can analyze Paul Grimaud and say what a, what a terrible, um, fake it is, just the recreation of history for consumption, uh, spanning the gap between Crea and Kulo by sheer mechanistic uh, mechanicians and so on. But it nevertheless seems to me to be a good deal better than most local authority housing because it is based on the idea of home. And the idea of vernacular, for instance, can encompass quite a, um, quite a wide degree of uh, understanding of rational building types. Chicago facing up to the lake before the high buildings were built. This is the older 19th century part. Or Tel Aviv facing up to its seafront. Both have the characteristic of uh, towns where the style of building is a received style. It's a convention. And everybody understands it and enjoys it. And you can get individuality of building while you get agreement about what the building is meant to be. It's clear that we have a difference here between the design aims inspired by rationalism, the rationalism which has got going since the Enlightenment, and the tradition which children receive in particular through storybooks, when a class of children is asked to draw my home, and when they happen to live in east of London, you'll get this kind of contrast. The two sources of my home are, in fact, where I live and what it should be like according to the pictures. And it's that side, that trail of are things which we call tradition, which the pictures, of course, are, are and the storybooks are one aspect of, which I'm referring to. A lot of, um, a lot of um, curious things have been said recently as people have got onto this and realized that storybooks given to children do, in fact, uh, continue uh, uh, terrible prejudices, such as the role of boys and girls, for example, obedience, socialization, all those things, we've suddenly realized that this is where they all get it from, and we're going to stop it, perhaps. You know. But I don't think we can stop it that easily, because the question is, they have to have picture books of some kind, and it's very difficult to prevent, I think, ideology creeping in. Uh, again, if we want a little bit of guidance as to what people think of as a house, it's quite interesting to go to marginal situations where the house is fragile, uh, this is a camping site on the suburb of Paris, which is for Le Camping. But they haven't been able to stop a lot of Algerians and people actually buying their plots and putting up houses, which consist of a tent, but it's not very long. Quite a lot of time spent on the gravel, out there in the forecourt, and the general idea that this is a proper house, in case you didn't think so. And again, this caravan has been made into a proper house by the addition of some curlicue iron railings purchased at Woolworth which uh, carry a whole load of uh, 
of signification. A shanty town in Nottingham uh, shows uh, far more attention and care lavished on the boundaries and the approach to the house than on, than on making the, the caravan or, 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 uh, or hut into anything much different. I mean, an amazing amount of care. And this does seem to show that people are very conscious of questions of status and privacy and definition of their, of their uh, social uh, face and that they give a lot of time to that. And uh, I like to think that this permeates a very large section of the population. This is a very, very delightful, I think, little, little shanty town in which the, the witch gate, the curly iron, and the wooden nightingale, together with little bits of, of lash-up uh, um, garden, garden paling and this and that and the other, all contrive to make a set of screen behind screen behind screen, which emphasizes the privacy and importance of that privacy of the town dweller of the house dweller. This villa on the right, a very expensive villa in Bishop's Avenue, shows the same, exactly the same kind of uh, intention to show the boundaries of privacy in a rather more pretentious way. Sorry about this. Uh, this is to do with the natural uh, desire to make your building half timbered. Everybody has this natural desire to make your building half timbered, I think, um, and uh, I'll pass on or uh, these, these again, which are at South Sea, self-built houses, I think remarkably uh, pretty houses, show the imagination and, uh, and um, dreaminess that can result from somebody really lavishing love on the house. So where, in this case, it's the house and not the fences that got all the love, and I think they're delicious. Uh, well, when architects come to this problem of the small house, it comes over in a different way because of their need to do design. Uh, Peter Bannum said of the Smithson's house at Watford that it was subtly subversive. It, it set up a lot of hackles. Uh, why? Because it took the, 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 the technology and craft off all the houses in the neighborhood, cheap little post-war houses, and did it in a kind of neo-Palladian way so that uh, you get uh, a statement around the big window. The French door, the L-shaped windows make a a kind of decoration around the main living room window. And it's quite symmetrical, except that you turn this window around because it's a kitchen window or something, and that pushes the big window over a little bit. And you can understand that formally. But it does create a building that has its memory of the modern movement in it. The way in which the brickwork going up into the angles of the, of the L-shaped bedroom windows creates a blank panel of the row Palladian kind. Or again, with Ted Cullinan in Camden, um, there is considerable subversion here. Uh, in fact, uh, the lad was, was determined to show that he wasn't going to do an old Regency hack thing. And nevertheless, in a curious kind of way, although it is a semi-detached house, it battens on its neighbor. Perhaps it's the white rendered base which runs through both but in fact, one almost can enjoy it as a single house. And uh, nevertheless, it obviously shows a jump in language, a change of, of uh, attitude, and the architect determining not to do a neo-regency or a neo-Victorian rather facade. And this seems to be where we find that uh, design is very difficult. We find it very difficult to conform with tradition um, because we have this inbuilt Modern, modern movement thing is that everything has to be restated and turned into a problem which is then solved, that it has to be systematic, that it has to be abstract. Um, and I suppose the last statement of this must be Rainer Bannum's, uh, uh, a home is not a house, a home can be well ventilated air bubble, uh, well heated too, if you're going to put it up in Buffalo, I think it would have to be well heated, don't you think so, Cedric? Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it doesn't look too much like that little house with the wooden nightingale. In fact, I can't quite work out what it would look like uh, from the section. Um, Herb Green's house, again, is metaphoric to a degree. If you woke up in the car, having been parked outside, you might think that an aged bison was charging at you. And uh, it quite clearly enjoys not being easily recognizable as a house. <coughs> Well, I just uh, 
wonder about this. The, the moment when a house has significance uh, is quite important, and one tends, I think, as architects to make a very easy linkage between the significance of the house at its initial point and its significance forever. Uh, when William Morris got Philip Webb to build the red house for him, uh, he influenced his architect to a point where a new easy-going statement of Gothic or vernacular is made. Well, there are Gothic traces in the, in the two windows here. But the novelty was in that it was really free to adjust to exigencies of inside in a modest way and to be, uh, in fact, uh, in the in in the days of traditional craftsmanship, and it has been quoted ever since, both as a source of the modern movement uh, uh, attitude towards convention, the ability to, to break it away. It was like Pugin couldn't invent a true functional Gothic architecture because he was obsessed with churches and ritual. But William Morris, who was thinking about craft, was able through his architect to do this very thing. And yet, this language of the vernacular has been very quickly absorbed, only some 40 years later of that, by Lutyens in building for rich clients. He combined vernacular elements with classical elements in a personal way, which uh, in fact uh, put those elements at the service of a nouveau riche class. I think architects are always liable to make the mistake that the character that they, they see at the moment where it emerges is a fixed character and doesn't change. And, and that this, in fact, is the source of the current, uh, uh, well, paranoia in a way about image and about having the right image for houses. And yet I see that, I mean, this is Bank Street Princeton and this is a street in Sydney, uh, that we get a really very graceful form of street architecture when there's none of this design care at all, but just a, a simple understanding by people of a convention of the street, in which every house can be different, but not because Ralph Erskine says so. And again, the terrace can be uh, the result of a, a more or less accidental fusion of individual efforts, as in this house in Czechoslovakia, or it can be highly smoothed over, as in many English Georgian squares and terraces, in the interest of urbanity. And there is no difficulty about this because the individual house stands out, as does the total smoothness of the terrace. Uh, it does seem to me that our paranoia has got to remarkable lengths when uh, all different sites at built routines are built according to a kind of last minute ideology of what is the right image for housing. Uh, Erskine's, uh, Erskine's uh, estate, uh, in which every house is literally different, uh, is clearly based on some idea of a medieval huddle, whereas the Grunt Group's thing was based on a crossover between uh, 18th century terraces and modern industrialized production with a bit of corb uh, dialectic thrown in, the, the hedgerows going through to break it up. And uh, when I wrote about these two schemes, I got almost universal uh, response in terms of, but how can you like that straight line thing? It's a it's terrible imposition. In fact, I'm looking right at somebody who said that to me, yes? But you were only one of many, Martin, who said, this is the wrong image for housing. Now, it does seem to me this is very strange. One thinks about the reality of Milton Keynes, all these different uh, uh, estates are all fixed by the Llewellyn Davies plan, uh, which carved up the city into a non-visual realm by the use of curving roads, and which reduces each of the separate areas to a kind of drawing board, a drawing board for design to happen in. The architects come along with their design, and they try to establish a total design pattern in which everything is controlled and uh, um, um, nothing is left out. But the difference is that whereas Erskine must see that every house is individually different, uh, the Grunt Group were content to adopt a global image, a group image of the terrace, and to hope that that would be uh, sufficient to give people individuality. The houses do stand out in the way the traditional houses stand out. Um, there could come a moment when the individual paints his house red or cream, 
and we no longer have the uniformity of the terrace, I hope that they would welcome that moment. Uh, there is a curious analogy to be drawn by the super studio send-up of management uh, gone uh, uh, berserk, in which the whole world is to be carved up by design, and the actual ground plan at Milton Keynes, where in the interest of extending the Ghani idea of design for growth and change, a lot of space has been made, a lot of enclaves have been built, there's plenty of marginal space on the, on the individual estates, and the whole thing is kind of meant to, to grow bit by bit. But it, this, this obsession with growth has been paralleled by an obsession with shape. It is actually wanted. Uh, as Mahadi pointed out, that the roads should be curvilinear and not straight, for example, so that they would demonstrate uh, that they belong to the movement of cars and so that they would prevent any, uh, any hint of monumentality in the architect's and, and planner's design. I think that uh, there is a curious analogy here because that non-visual carve-up of the space has been just as deleterious, in my opinion, as the super studio diagram uh, suggests. Well, now, that's really all I have to say. It's to really ask us to stop being uh, such um, um, maniacs for design and to accept that what we want, really, is megastructures, which are not huge servicing organizations with fine form, but are, in fact, simply social conventions uh, by which things can be put together. Leon Prier calls it uh, uh, streets and squares. I wouldn't uh, go so far as to say that we're restricted to the classical repertoire of public spaces, but I think that streets and squares are a very good beginning, and that if we start thinking about this problem, we might begin to invent spaces that had a character for our time. But in any case, we must learn that buildings that are approached through a door or behind a garden wall have got this quality of personal uh, uh, identity, which is what people seem to want, whatever the political system. Uh, there is a particular poignancy in looking at examples from just that time when the modern movement was coming into existence, when architects were going through uh, a kind of process into abstraction and simplicity, uh, Macintosh at the time of the Art Nouveau, or uh, um, Robert Malley Stevens, just after the war, at the time of incipient Art Deco. These buildings do have a, a fascination for us right now, because the curve then was upwards, but now the curve is downwards. We're going back down into decoration. And I don't think there's any harm in that. That's what people want. That's what they should get. It's very poignant to look at, again, this is the Koen the Koenig, uh, a drawing of, of a, a project for farm buildings, I think it's 1919 a drawing for an industrial worker's house three years later, you can see the process moving towards abstraction and towards design. And I'm suggesting to you that the direction of that pro process now should be reversed. We should go backwards down that same profile. Uh, this is uh, on the right, jo Gilbert and George imitating machines. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have to go back to a situation where uh, this reverse paradox doesn't work and where we can, in fact, decorate our bodies uh, the way everybody else does in the old world. Thank you very much.